Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Do you remember, did you do science fair projects growing up? Um, I did a lot more art fairs, but I definitely did some science projects. Do you do you remember any of them? Yeah, I remember a really complicated, correct me with the science words, but um, a, re- <laughs> a really complicated, my father and I spent a lot of time building a tower out of balsa wood. Okay, That sure. was supposed to hold weight through the center. Okay. So we would put the tower like on two, you know, tables. Yeah. And the tower would be in between and then the weight hung in between. I did not win that. I say it's a competition. I don't know if it was a competition, but I did not win that. But it was yeah. yeah. That's, that's interesting. I I had totally forgot about this, but I did something like that too. Really? So ours were ours were bridges. Um Okay. They didn't necessarily go they weren't vertical towers, but same idea, right? Mm-hmm. We would build like a bridge that was I don't know, like a foot long and over some sort of a a crevasse and we would hang stuff off of them and see what they would uh what they would hold up to um oh this is really funny this is also reminding me so i did fine Uh at that uh i was going to be i was actually going to be an engineer before (gasps) i decided to be a biologist yeah i'm good with uh, the 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 visual stuff okay but there was a um do you remember the bar argonaut in dc have you ever heard of this bar i think so Okay, so uh, bar in DC, and like, that's not the important part, but they had science trivia every week. This was a few years ago now, oh. and part of the trivia is like obviously to remember science facts, but there was always an engineering challenge, and it'd be things like drop an egg out a window and see if it will hold, or build a bridge and see if it will like hold some sort of a thing or whatever. Wait, this was at a bar. At a bar, yeah. So you were. Wait, we were building you stuff. Were, you were building stuff at a bar and dropping eggs out of windows at a bar. Yeah, they'd give us like glue and Q-tips and so this is not a casual happy hour. Oh no, challenge. this was intense. And okay. I do like I'm a, I'm a scientist by training. I'm fine with science recalling stuff, but I was awesome at engineering challenges. Oh, cool. Yeah, so didn't really do a lot of it growing up, but I guess I I made up for it in my later years. <laughs> You blossomed. You were a late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. I would have had a lot of fun at that. I'm just really competitive. Yeah. What I lack yeah. in skill and training, I make up for <laughs> in intensity. Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. So I'm a bit surprised that when either of us think of science fairs, we don't think of what well, what I, well, I think is kind of the stereotypical science fair project. Mm-hmm. Like what 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 do you think of when you think science fair? Um, growing plants like electric potatoes. <laughs> oh, that's a good yeah, one. Oh, Vicky, one. I love so much that like you're not a scientist. This works so <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That is that is a genuine, like a genuine statement. Yeah. I think when I think of science fair, I think of the volcano. Okay. Like the the oh um, goodness, I don't know the baking soda and vinegar. I think that's the chemical reaction. That I sounds should know right. this. You should I've know never this. done it though. You're a, a bona fide scientist. Bona fide scientist. Throw that back in my face. Yeah. Um well, so along that line though, so we're we're here today not necessarily to talk about school science fair projects or any of that but we are talking mm-hmm. about volcanoes um yeah. but not necessarily homemade ones uh talking about ones out in the world and so this week we have an interview with a real life volcanologist who among other things and keeping with our theme of extinctions is going to talk about what exactly it means when volcanoes go extinct oh i can't wait Hi, I'm Dr. Janine Krepner. I am an associate, honorary associate researcher at the University of Waikato here in New Zealand, and I am a volcanologist. So volcanology is a really broad area, right? Kind of what's your, uh, what's your specialty? Like what about volcanoes? My specialty is kind of broad too. I've worked on several different kinds of eruptions. So volcanian, like letting off kind of relatively small ash plumes, strombolian, which we see at places like Etna, where there are these beautiful, almost firework displays. 
I've worked on pyroclastic flows, which are incredibly dangerous and deadly. I've used remote sensing, which is satellites, so data from space to look at eruptions as well. And that's what I might be getting a little more into again. And on top of all of that, I'm really interested in how we can communicate um, about volcanoes and volcanic hazards so that people can help themselves stay safe around volcanoes. So you're you're kind of a, a Janine of all trades, essentially. <laughs> I, I just love volcanoes, all of it. <laughs> Since you are kind of this, you have a, a broad knowledge base, I wanted to talk to you today about this theme we're doing on extinctions. And I think when a lot of folks think or hear the word extinct, they think biological extinction, which is understandable. But there are other things that go extinct. And so when we use the term extinction when it comes to volcanoes, what does that, what does that actually mean? basically means that volcano is never going to erupt again. It's done, it's lived its happy volcano erupty life, and now it's just going to sit there. If it built up a massive cone, that's going to slowly erode away and become part of the environment around it. So it's reached the end of its lifestyle. Now, how do we how do we know that that's the case versus being like dormant, for example? It's a good question, and that can actually be pretty tough. There are some that are more obvious, like if we look at the Hawaiian volcanic chain, for example, that's an easy one. Like as you go further northwest, the islands are no longer active because the tectonic plate, the Pacific plate, has been moving through time. So the source of the magma below the surface is now no longer beneath those islands. It's now beneath the big island and a slightly offshore. So those volcanoes have been cut off from the magma source, not going to erupt again. I have to I have to plead ignorance on how exactly volcanoes work. The biologist in me is is partial or, or I have my own bias when it comes to extinctions. Is that how volcanoes go extinct? Basically it's like a cover that's covering over the magma source or they're like through this tectonic plate shifting, or are there are other ways in which this can happen. Yeah, so it's essentially any way that the magma is no longer reaching the surface, whether that's because the magma is no longer there, the subsurface has changed. So we have a lot of volcanoes around subduction zones, which is where you have one tectonic plate subducting below the other. If the angle of that plate changes, so if it becomes deeper, or some kind of change like that, you can move the magma source away from a volcano. So the volcano itself is just like the pile of stuff that comes out during eruptions. The driver of eruptions is way below the surface. So we have hot spots like Hawaii, where we have these essentially mantle plumes of hot areas where a lot of magma can melt at really high temperatures, and that's why we have those really runny lavas. But if we have a tectonic plate moving over it, Eventually, the location of where that, if you think of, I mean, this is, of course, grossly simplifying it, but if you think of a sort of pipe, it's not a pipe, but if you think of a pipe going to the surface, if you're moving the actual ground away from it, there's no longer access to the magma. It's definitely not a pipe, though. Please, no one repeat that. Visual only. <laughs> just, 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 just to clarify, not a pipe. Not a pipe. Can't say it enough. <laughs> So, Vicky, do you, you know how magma works? How magma works. I guess de define works. I'm thinking it's hot, it's gooey, mm -hmm. it is made underground. Yeah. And expands. And it comes up, though, comes up. to cochinine, not through a pipe. That is an imperfect... Uh, <laughs> Not, an yeah. imperfect metaphor. I, I, in all <laughs> fairness, I'm a. We talk about this. I'm a biologist. I didn't take geology uh, in I school. I took geology. Well, it sounds like neither of us. You have a leg up on me, but neither of us are truly understanding of the internal no. workings of these things. So let's uh, let's go back to Janine to figure some of this out. Okay. Yeah, you can definitely have areas where if there's a huge, like a, a really thick mountain range that's in the way, or you know we, how you know. I mean, there's a lot of granite around Washington, D.C., where you are. So, you know, granite is this incredibly hard body. What granite is, is it's actually a magma reservoir that never erupted. And we, as we can see, there are huge amounts of granite and rocks like granite around the world. So there's a lot of magma that never actually erupts. 
the type of lava, uh, sorry, magma, magma below the surface, lava above the surface. Important distinction. Also, no pipes, but <laughs> but so we have the magma. Um, it's really sticky. It's viscous. It's it's kind of really hard to move. This stuff is, it's not solid, but it's not runny like the the lavas we see on Hawaii either. And it's also not just liquid magma under the surface. There's a mixture of solid rock in it. There's a lot of crystals that can grow in it. So it can actually be this stuff that's super hard to get moving. And that's generally very generally, why we don't see a lot of really big, really explosive eruptions. The stuff can just get to the point where it's just too sluggish. It's not moving up anymore. Can an eruption happen, or maybe not an eruption, but can magma get through at a source that's not what we would consider a volcano? If it gets through, then it is a volcano. But we do- oh, is that literally the definition? <laughs> that's the definition where, of a volcano. Where, okay. <laughs> Shane, how do you not know what a volcano is? <laughs> we're, we're learning what I don't know this episode. This is really fun. Uh, in all fairness, I never really thought of the technical definition. Okay. All right. Well, let's get back to maybe something a little easier that you can maybe handle better. <laughs> okay. Getting back to kind of this idea of like what makes a volcano extinct or not or a dormant so volcanoes can't become unextinct correct because then it's not extinct in the first place exactly gotcha do you by chance know like what the longest period of time has been between an eruption of of any volcano like is there a well-known case of this happening yeah so there are definitely been volcanoes that have erupted when people didn't know it was a volcano i believe pinatubo I think, I could be wrong, but I think Pinatubo was one of these cases where it was a pretty low mountain range and it had been eroded away because it usually produces explosive volcanic deposits, which erode Mm -hmm. much faster. So they'd like little bits of volcanic ash. If you think of like sand and rocks and that kind of stuff, as opposed to thick, solid lava flows. So that ended up producing the second largest eruption of the last century. So people started feeling earthquakes and then volcanologists went in and investigated it and went, oh gosh, this thing really produces big eruptions when it goes. Yeah, I was actually, I was going to ask, are there any examples of folks thinking a volcano was extinct and then it actually erupting? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because like, if you think of our human lives are so short, (laughs) like for a, a volcano to be classed as young, it erupted within the last 10, 12,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, one, you know, we go in at geologists and look at what volcanoes have done in the past, and we can get ages. Uh, we call it dating, not the fun kind of dating most people think of, but we can date those rocks. So, get an age for that rock, depending on what type of rock it is, or if there's things like uh, tree bits that have been incorporated into the deposit. And sometimes you're like, oh, gosh, this thing's like way more active than we thought it was. And that's, you know, got to have the time and the resources to do it. And the technology becomes better as we go, too. So sometimes we find out a volcano is way more active than we thought it was. And we should probably pay more attention to it. See, I'm not the only one who doesn't get it. Okay, you could keep telling yourself that. When it comes to how volcanoes work, the understanding, in my experience, is very, very low. And and it same goes with biology, right? Like, I literally am in a human body, but if you ask me to point out most of the parts of it, I'd be like, oh, uh, this general region. <laughs> so it's one of those things where we think we know a lot about it, and then once you actually start thinking of the specifics, there's not a, lo- a lot of knowledge there. So one of the most widespread things that comes out of a volcano is volcanic ash, And something that is a pet peeve of mine, and all my friends know this and people make fun of me for it, is I can't stand seeing it being called smoke. Especially when people are saying it's spewing smoke, like that just, ah, hate it. (laughs) But there's an important difference. Like smoke is something that is caused by combustion and it has its own hazards, especially depending on what's burning. But volcanic ash is pulverized rock. 
So it's got um, glass in it. It's got crystals in it. It's rock. It can be extremely fine. It can be up to two millimeters in diameter, these grains. So the, the hazards are very, very different. Like you don't want to be breathing in either smoke or volcanic ash, but smoke won't collapse your house if it can accumulates. It Volcanic ash can damage water supplies. It can, you know, if it gets in your eyes, it sucks, speaking from experience. So it's just such a simple thing, right? It's the most common thing we see coming out of a volcano, but the the idea that it's actually exploded rock bits is usually quite surprising to most people. I'm going to say it makes sense. Just just thinking about it kind of intuitively, right? Smoke rises, so like smoke would go away. But I, at least in my experience, any sort of aftermath of volcanoes where it hasn't been the lava of what you're seeing, what you're seeing is this ash that's deposited on cars or like you said, people's houses. Or So yeah, it's definitely not that. I mean, I understand why folks might think that way, mm-hmm. but definitely an important distinction from not just a, vernacular perspective like literally a public safety perspective yeah yeah and it's also a a pain in the butt perspective too like i destroyed my first pair of glasses i wore in the field because if you get tiny bits of rock on your glasses and then you wipe it off with your shirt you've just destroyed your lens so cameras and all of that stuff if you have ash in your car and you like wipe it off you are it's and you don't want to be in an airplane and a volcanic ash plume either because that can shut down your engines whereas smoke generally won't do that as far as i'm aware yeah that's happened right yeah like one well, i know that's why the volcano in iceland that i cannot pronounce <laughs> thank you i know that's why they grounded a lot of flights when that erupted here's a well, not years ago now, but yeah, when it did. 2010? 2010. I guess it is a while ago. But have, have do you know if there have been instances where planes have like actively been caught in? Yes. Like have had ash sucked in? Yeah, there have been multiple. Generally, like they've had experienced full engine failure, so planes going down. They've all managed to get the engines going again. But oh. you can imagine the trauma you would experience from your plane suddenly plunging from the sky. You know, that would be an absolutely horrific experience in itself. So, yeah, we do not want planes going through volcanic ash. And, and the Eiffel Lyoko eruption actually spurred a lot of, OK, well, how much ash does there have to be in order for it to be dangerous? Because people underneath that plume of very fine volcanic ash looking up, couldn't really see it like they might have seen something that was a bit hazy but it's not like a dark ash plume blocking out the sunlight so a lot of research was then done into how much ash does it take to be dangerous vicky have you ever seen a volcano erupt um yeah like right in the middle of dc no of course not that's dangerous. Have you ever seen one? <laughs> That's dangerous. It would be it would be concerning, among other things, if right. a volcano just like popped up in the middle of DC. Uh, just add that to the list of problems that our country is going through. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, I in person, no, I have not. Just in movies. Uh, but I did have a question about that for Janine. You mentioned movies, so I think you and I have talked about this before. Dante's Peak or volcano? Dante's Peak, hundred percent. Why? The eruption is amazing. I mean, the lava flow sucks. You shouldn't have a lava flow with that massively, massively explosive eruption. But the explosive eruption part where they have this pyroclastic flow racing down, like destroying the forest. And pyroclastic flow is that volcanic ash I spoke about, plus larger rocks, plus really hot gas, all racing down a volcano at incredibly high speeds. And that's this was actually based on the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption. And they did okay. an incredible job. Volcano in Los Angeles is it's not even a volcanic area. So <laughs> Yeah. I actually I, I was on a vacation in the the North Cascades a few years ago now. And we stayed at we stayed at this like small cottage, like right outside of North Cascades. There was like no internet, anything like that. But they had a heck of a DVD collection and we watched Dante's Peak because it seemed quite fitting yeah and it holds up i uh, i was actually pretty surprised it does it does like 
now that, you know, since I've gained a lot more experience, I realized that the main character, Harry Dalton, was kind of being a jerk. Like, he should not have been freaking <laughs> out the town. They did need more data. And they kind of villainized the head of the team who's like, we need more data. Don't go freaking out the townspeople. Sit down and shut up kind of thing. But he was right. Like, you can't just go in there and be like, oh, gosh, there was a few earthquakes. The volcano is going to destroy the town. The thing that I do like about the movie Volcano is that it actually shows the emergency management side of it. Like in Dante's Peak, they have mm. the head of the team ordering a military evacuation. Like, that that doesn't happen. That comes from someone else. So for yeah. all the emergency managers out there, Dante's Peak is not so great. And Volcano is a bit better in that respect. Dante's Peak is my favorite. Have you have you seen Dante's Peak? I think I've seen Dante's Peak, but but I'm getting I think I'm getting it confused with Lake Placid with the crocodile. Is that are they related? <laughs> no, <laughs> they're no, they're not related. Okay. Oh, I want to say no. There is there's there's a really um, iconic water scene in mm-hmm. Dante's Peak where okay. like the grandmother. Spoiler alert: the grandmother kind of melts. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. maybe that's maybe that's the imagery like the, the water imagery grandma's on like, water is the connection grandma's in water <laughs> yeah that might that might be the connection yeah uh, that we're thinking about um well so while you and i can only talk about our favorite in movies related to volcanoes or sure. otherwise uh janine actually gets to live it so I've worked on several volcanoes, not a Hawaii volcano in New Zealand, which is um, Mount Doom in Lord of the Rings is, I mean, the top, nice. the top of it is CGI. It's not actively erupting like that, but that was the volcano I really fell in love with as a little girl who would go down and visit them. And I'd just stare at this thing and I actually got to work on it. So climbing this steep volcano for the first time and then getting up and staring into the crater, which was my field site which I'm still working on, cool. was just, uh, it took my breath away. And another one would be looking at Tolbachek in Kamchatka, Russia, where there was this lava, big lava flow that was in place two years before we were there, and it was still really hot. On the inside, it was like solid, but it was still really hot. So I went into this, it was, you know, we, we, a lot of people know of lava tubes. It's where lava, the, the surface cools and forms solid rock and internally it keeps draining away. So then you're left with these big tubes within the lava flow. This was like a cavern. It was enormous. And I went down there with a colleague and it was so hot that my necklace I was wearing started burning my skin and my, oh my eyeballs God. started drying out. And it was just like this insane, amazing experience working on this lava flow over there and yeah, it's any time I'm on a volcano is this amazing mix of excitement and passion and feeling like, ah, oh, I'm home. This is where I'm meant to be. Have you taken lava samples? Not active lava samples, no. Life goal though. There's this image in my mind, and I don't know, I don't know who it is, but like a well, like guy going out suit, pick lava. I can't. How hot? Like when you, or is there a number? Like when you are close? I don't know how how long. Like. 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever, how hot on the surface is or can lava be? Like what kind of temperatures are we talking about? So if you think of when you're, when you've preheated an oven, if you're like me and one of those great intelligent people who like open the oven door, don't wait for it to cool and like shove your face into it to grab whatever's in. Like if you can think of that, that punch, that heat punch, that kind of like, whoa, your eyes are now like you're blinking and it's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only for a few seconds. And it's only around, I don't know, it's 180 degrees Celsius is usually, and I can't remember what it is in Fahrenheit. What's the usual temperature you cook in in Fahrenheit? 350. Yeah, that's right. 350, 400 is Fahrenheit temperature. Yeah, so that's 180 degrees Celsius. So lava, we're talking hundreds of degrees Celsius. When those lava flows you see at Hawaii actually erupt initially, they're over 1,000 degrees Celsius. Oh my gosh. So intense, intense heat. Like I haven't been near an active lava flow. I've been near a man-made lava flow where they put rock, lava rock, into a furnace and then produce this five meter long lava flow. And getting near that, it was like it feels like intense sunburn. 
It's mm. really, really hot. And that was the tiniest amount of lava. So even when you're wearing heat protective gear, you can't stay there for very long. You've got to get in and out as soon as you can. I personally don't think I need to get up close and personal with a volcano. No, of course, me either. But I guess people do it, right? Um, People that shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course. And honestly, there are even safety recommendations for those who are enjoying, quote unquote, enjoying volcanoes responsibly. But those who are in areas that might have active volcanoes that could be active for hundreds or heck, even thousands of years, um, they should even just know some things before going as well. We have people who live around volcanoes. We now have, well, (laughs) not so much in the last two years, but Usually we have people who visit volcanoes, like tourism, as we were just talking about, is massive. You can go to volcanoes, Mm -hmm. you can look over an an active lava lake in some areas. Just always, always keep in mind that volcanoes are inherently dangerous, even when they're not erupting. You can have rock falls, landslides, flash floods. There are so many things that can go wrong on a volcano. Bears, (laughs) wildlife, (laughs) driving these crazy roads around volcanoes because it's a really dynamic landscape. And just do a little bit of work. Like, who is the volcano observatory? If something happens, what do I need to think about? Like, most volcanic eruptions produce volcanic ash. Do you have a mask with you to protect against that? Do you know what to do? Do you know where to go to get good information? Because there is so much more bad information online about volcanoes than there is good information. So knowing who that source is, so it's USGS in the United States, it's GNS in New Zealand, every country and sometimes regions within that country has that. And also the emergency management. Who is the emergency management agency that will be giving this information? Just, you know, before we go to a lot of areas, we check what vaccines we need. Do we need to get vaccinated against, you know, dengue fever? What What is it, rabies? Just, just if you're going near an active volcano, know what to do if something happens. Just give a little bit of thought about it because there's so many cases where volcanoes erupt and there are non-locals there and you're so much more vulnerable if you just have no idea what to do. So Vicky, what's, what's the most unsafe thing you've done or, or, or one of the most unsafe things you've done in your life? No, I literally have no idea. I'm I wish I think. wish people could just like see the 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 look in your face. You're like, what? I don't know. You've lived I a very safe no life. Idea. Well, I feel like I've lived a very safe life, but also like nothing. Like I feel like I've done a lot of things that felt very unsafe at the time, but like in retrospect, like I was just being soft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and, and in all fairness, I mean, I wrote this question and I was thinking, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I've broken some bones, like I oh. fell out of a tree once because I was Mm-mm. I was just being irresponsible. But yeah, I'm not I'm not actively putting myself in situations. Ooh, you got one? Uh, a silly one. I r- I rode a very tiny circus bicycle with no hands. Um, and fell on my face. <laughs> um, and I knew, like, obviously that's not safe for a non-trained <laughs> circus professional. Well, I, I have to say, if that's uh, if that's the only thing that's coming to mind, I think uh, you and I are doing pretty well with ourselves. Good. Okay. We're doing quite, quite responsible lives. <laughs> uh, and, and so with that, I want to thank Janine for chatting with us. This episode was produced by me with audio engineering from Colin Warren. We would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review this podcast. And you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. So yeah, it was it chose me, I guess. I didn't chose volcanoes. Chose the you. volcano life chose me. <laughs> like, uh, uh, like when people... Um, when people get like a, a dog or a cat that's a rescue, it's yes. like, 
I didn't rescue it. It, it rescued, rescued me. me. Yeah. I can... Speaking as one of those people, right? Like <laughs> oh, yeah. we didn't rescue that dog. Like he's living a fine life. Like it's it's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, same goes with, with my two cats and, and my volcanoes, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea about thinking of like volcanoes as pets. They're not pets, they're not... just like they're not pike, but like you can just... have a pit rock, <laughs> but you can <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's no adoptive volcano program out there. Uh, no, no, there's not currently. Maybe that's a way to get get us some good funding in volcano monitoring. Is adoptive oh, volcano? There you go. There you go. 